Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being much more in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 211, I think, and we're talking about John D. I've talked about John D. in passing in other episodes, but I don't think I've ever done a whole episode just on him. So let's talk about the man who's known as Elizabeth's Eyes, this Renaissance man who blended science and spirituality in a way that we really wouldn't ever see again, because then the Enlightenment took over and science and spirituality were separated for good. But it wasn't always like that. After all, the early chemists were actually alchemists looking to create gold, for example. But I digress. Before we get started, just a shout out and thank you to the newest supporters of the podcast, Bernice, Bobby, and Betty Lynn. Thank you for coming on board and supporting the podcast on Patreon. Patrons get extra episodes author chats, and other fun things. Just this past week, we had a live chat with true crime podcaster and history teacher Jill McCracken about the death of Amy Robsart. This week, there's a patron episode on spies in Elizabethan England, including double agents. So you can become a patron for as little as a dollar an episode. Just head to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon.com slash Englandcast to join the community. All right, let's dive in. John Dee, a prominent figure of Elizabeth's reign, stands out not merely for his contribution to astrology, but also the multifaceted roles he undertook as an accomplished mathematician, astronomer, teacher, occultist, and alchemist. Dee was the embodiment of the Renaissance spirit, a union of science, mysticism, and ambition. He was born on July 13, 1527 in Tower Ward in London. His lineage intertwined with nobility. His family was deeply rooted in Welsh heritage. His surname, D, comes from the Welsh term du, which means black. His father, Roland D, served as a gentleman courtier to Henry VIII, bringing a degree of prominence to the family. His pride in his ancestry was evident. He often spoke of his descent from Rodri the Great, the 9th century ruler of Gwynedd. To further solidify his connection to the nobility, he crafted a pedigree that traced his lineage back to the coronation of Henry Tudor as Henry VII. His educational pursuits began at the Chelmsford Chantry School. By 1542, at the age of 15, he went to St. John's College, Cambridge. His remarkable abilities did not go unnoticed. By the mid-1540s, he had not only graduated, but become an original fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, which was founded by Henry VIII right around that time. While at Trinity, his ingenious stage effects for a production of Aristophanes' piece solidified his reputation as a magician. He wanted to expand his horizons, and so he went to Europe during the late 1540s and early 1550s. He studied in places like Louvain, and he delivered lectures in Paris on the works of the Greek mathematician Euclid. During his European endeavors, he encountered and befriended notable figures of the time, such as Frisius, Gerardus Mercator, and Abraham Ortelius. His thirst for knowledge even took him to Italy, where he worked alongside Federico Comandino. When he returned to England, he had amassed a significant collection of mathematical and astronomical instruments, a testament to his unwavering commitment to scholarship. After Edward VI's death in 1553, the Protestant Reformation in England faced a severe setback as Mary I, a Catholic, ascended the throne. Given Dee's Protestant leanings and connections, this change in the religious environment presented some potential dangers for him. Early in Mary's reign in 1555, he faced accusations of calculating or using horoscopes to predict Queen Mary's death. This was a very serious charge, tantamount to treason, as predicting the death of a monarch could be seen as an attempt to bring it about. He was arrested and brought before the Star Chamber. And Elizabeth actually had some involvement in this episode. Before she became queen, she was imprisoned by her half-sister Mary, on suspicions of her involvement in Wyatt's Rebellion. 
The rebellion aimed to prevent Mary's marriage to Philip of Spain, which many English subjects opposed. Elizabeth's involvement was never proven, but she was sent to the Tower of London for a time as a precaution. It's believed that during this period, Dee cast horoscopes for both Mary and Elizabeth. The horoscope for Mary reportedly predicted a fatal outcome for her reign, while Elizabeth's forecasted her ascendancy. This act, particularly the horoscope for Mary, was dangerous because casting a monarch's horoscope without permission, especially one predicting their death, was considered treasonous. He was arrested and charged with treason. His alleged act of plotting against the queen using enchantments and magic was taken seriously. However, during his trial, Dee defended himself by demonstrating his sincere religious faith and loyalty to the crown. He emphasized that his actions were scholarly pursuits without malicious intent. His solid defense, combined with his evident knowledge and expertise, likely played a role in his eventual acquittal. Although there's no concrete evidence that Elizabeth directly asked Dee to cast the horoscopes, the very act of casting them, especially with one foreseeing her rise, suggests that Dee had some sympathies or connections with those who wished for Elizabeth's eventual reign. When Elizabeth did ascend the throne, she remembered those who were loyal to her during her sister's reign, and Dee was among those who benefited from her favor. He was eventually released and even found himself serving Mary by participating in a commission to reform the Julian calendar, aligning it more closely with the solar year. This endeavor didn't come to full fruition in England until 1752, but his early involvement showcases his expertise in the matter. Following his release, Dee continued his studies and writings. While he had been closely aligned with the Protestant establishment under Edward VI, he was versatile enough to adapt to the changing circumstances of Mary's reign, emphasizing his scholarly pursuits over more overtly political or religious activities. When Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558, his fortunes improved significantly. His close relationship with Elizabeth, who held him in high esteem as her astrologer and consultant on scientific and mystical matters, ensured his protection and patronage. He actually chose her coronation date based on his astrological calculations. But Dee was more than just a royal confidant. He was a visionary driven by a desire to propel England to the forefront of global eminence. One of his groundbreaking ideas was the notion of a British empire. Even before the term gained its historical significance, Dee envisioned a maritime empire, a vast dominion stretching across continents, bound by the might of the English crown. His ambitions were clear to leverage England's prowess in navigation and exploration to establish colonies in the world. Dee's advocacy in this regard wasn't solely founded on geopolitical ambitions. He saw it as a means to bolster England's economic strength and enrich its cultural tapestry. Dee's commitment to navigation and cartography was profound. Under his guidance, many voyagers were trained he also had an enduring partnership with Gerardus Mercator, a renowned cartographer, reinforcing the symbiotic relationship between their disciplines. His extensive library at his home at Mortlake became a beacon for scholars, and it housed an impressive collection of maps and globes. It was not just the theoretical or strategic aspects of exploration that intrigued Dee. He was deeply involved in the practical facets as well. His influence extended to the creation and refinement of navigational instruments. This commitment to innovation was epitomized in the various artifacts attributed to him that we still have. Among these are Dee's speculum or mirror, a hand mirror shaped obsidian object that actually was brought back from Mexico, it was Aztec, and the seal of God, a grand wax emblem, both of which are now housed in the British Museum. These items, apart from their intrinsic value, are a testament to the diverse interests that Dee pursued throughout his life. While Dee's professional pursuits painted a picture of a man deeply embedded in the fabric of Elizabethan governance and intellectual advancement, there were ideas about mysterious activities. Rumors suggested that he was not just Elizabeth's advisor, but also perhaps her secret agent, with a cryptic identifier that history would come to know intriguingly as 007. Amid the aura of mystique surrounding John Dee, one facet stands out prominently, casting him in the light 
of not just a scholar and advisor, but also a spy. Historical documents reveal cryptic correspondences between Dee and the Queen, where he often signed his letters with two circles symbolizing his own eyes, followed by a long, elongated seven. This unique signature was indicative of his claim that he was the Queen's eyes, a clandestine role where he gathered intelligence from Europe, serving as her secret agent. The peculiar signature, of course, has another parallel, 007, the fictional British spy James Bond. While the exact relation between Dee's signature and Ian Fleming's spy remains speculative, the similarity offers a tantalizing hint. It fuses the realms of fact and fiction, suggesting that perhaps the world's most famous spy had his origins in the shadowy corners of Elizabethan England. In an age teetering on the edge of enlightenment, John Dee was emblematic of the dichotomy of Renaissance thought. While deeply rooted in scientific discovery and rational thought, he was also irresistibly drawn to the realm of the occult and spiritualism. His interest in the supernatural was not a mere dalliance. It was an earnest pursuit for hidden truths. He believed that through specific rituals, invocations, and instruments, humans could communicate with angels celestial entities that held answers to the universe's deepest mysteries. For Dee, this wasn't about seeking personal power or arcane skills. It was a quest for divine knowledge, a bridge between the mortal and the eternal. He envisioned a unifying principle or universal language that connected all of creation, and he believed that this could be unlocked through angelic discourse. A central figure in Dee's spiritual expeditions was Edward Kelly, a self-proclaimed medium. Though Kelly had a questionable past with rumors of forgery and deceit trailing behind him, his purported ability to commune with the spiritual realm was something that Dee found invaluable. Together, the duo embarked on a series of spiritual conferences where Kelly, using a crystal ball or a showstone, would enter a trance-like state, claiming to relay messages from angels. These revelations were meticulously recorded by Dee in journals, with some of the transmissions in a unique script that came to be known as the Enochian language, named so as it was purportedly the same tongue spoken by the biblical figure Enoch. Their collaboration, though, was not without its controversies. While Dee was fiercely dedicated to their spiritual mission, Kelly's motivations remained ever ambiguous. Was he actually a genuine medium, a charlatan exploiting Dee's beliefs, or simply a man grappling with his own delusions? The question remains a subject of debate among historians. In 1583, driven both by angelic urgings through Kelly and political turbulence at home, Dee, Kelly, and their families ventured into Central Europe. Their aim was twofold, to share their revelations and seek patronage among the continent's nobility. The duo's reputation as the English magicians preceded them, drawing a mix of admiration, suspicion, and fear. Their endeavors led them to the courts of Emperor Rudolf II in Prague and King Stephen Bathory of Poland. While they found audiences willing to listen, they also encountered skepticism, especially when their angelic communications became political or entered into prophecy. John Dee and Edward Kelly's voyage into Europe was not merely a geographical journey, but also a spiritual and intellectual odyssey that both enlightened and challenged the contemporary understanding of mysticism and divination. In Poland, the pair found themselves in a land rife with its own blend of superstition and religious fervor. As they sought patronage and shared their angelic revelations, their activities garnered a blend of intrigue and skepticism. The Polish nobleman Albert Lasky was particularly captivated, inviting them to explore the potential of their spiritual pursuits further. However, their interactions were not without hurdles. Meeting King Stephen Barthory of Poland, they faced the challenge of convincing a devout Catholic monarch the veracity of their angelic communications, especially since such messages needed to align with established religious doctrines and papal endorsements. In Bohemia, their engagement with Emperor Rudolf II, a ruler known for his interest in alchemy and the arcane, was an epitome of their European encounters. While they faced a curious and somewhat supportive audience in the emperor, their claims, especially Kelly's vivid and often prophetic transmissions, sometimes bordered on the political, making them subjects of suspicion. 
Rumors circulated that Dee was a spy for Queen Elizabeth, using the guise of spiritualism to gather intelligence. Yet while they navigated through these treacherous waters of court politics and religious skepticism, they managed to steer clear of arrest, a testament to Dee's diplomatic skills and the genuine intrigue that their work evoked. But as they dived deeper into their spiritual conferences, fissures began to appear in their partnership. A significant point of contention emerged in Bohemia when Kelly, acting as the medium, relayed the startling angelic directive that the two men needed to share all of their possessions, including, interestingly, their wives. This edict shook the very foundation of their collaboration. While Dee, ever the earnest believer, grappled with the moral and personal implications of the message, questions arose about Kelly's motivations. Was this a genuine revelation or a manipulative ploy by Kelly, perhaps to gain ascendancy and distance himself from Dee? The ensuing events led to a growing disillusionment for Dee. The divergent paths of the two men, one a relentless seeker of divine truths and the other an enigmatic figure with ambiguous motivations, ultimately culminated in their separation. Behind the veil of celestial consultations and European expeditions, John Dee was, at heart, a family man. His most enduring bond was with Jane Fromond, whom he married when he was in his early 50s and she in her early 20s. Despite the age difference, the two shared a deep connection. But family life wasn't devoid of its own set of challenges. His commitment to his spiritual pursuits and the subsequent travels with Kelly meant prolonged separations from Jane and the children. These absences were fraught with uncertainties. The most heartrending episode occurred during their long sojourn in Europe. In Dee's absence, their Mortlake home was tragically ransacked. Priceless manuscripts, books, and personal items, vestiges of Dee's lifelong scholarly endeavors, were stolen or destroyed. Returning to a devastated home and shaken family, Dee would have been confronted with the stark realities of his dual life, one that straddled the realms of the mystical and the mundane. Amidst his celestial pursuits, his family stood as his grounding force, a reminder of the tangible and the transient. After returning to England, John Dee found himself in a homeland that had changed in his absence. The England he came back to was less hospitable to his blend of science, magic, and spirituality. The esteemed court astrologer, once the pinnacle of intellectual life, now faced the stark realities of a declining influence. One of the most poignant symbols of this decline was the desecration of his library at Mortlake. The repository of knowledge, which had been one of the largest in all of Europe, was ransacked and pillaged, many of its rare manuscripts, instruments, and books, painstakingly collected over a lifetime, were lost or scattered. This personal tragedy represented not just a material loss, but the cruel disillusion of Dee's intellectual legacy. So what happened with that was that while Dee was traveling in Europe in the 1580s, he entrusted the care of his library and laboratories to his brother-in-law, Nicholas. But according to Dee, he unduly sold it presently upon my departure or caused it to be carried away. Dee was devastated by the destruction. He tried to recover some of the items, but many, many of them stayed lost. Later, many of Dee's books became the possession of a Nicholas Saunder. And we don't know a lot about Nicholas Saunder. He may have been a former pupil, but Saunder must have known that his books had once belonged to Dee because he apparently tried to erase John Dee's signature multiple times and then cover up his signature with his own. So they may have been stolen. We don't know. But that's where many of Dee's books wound up with a Nicholas Saunder. And then that collection passed on to a Henry Pierpoint, Marquis of Dorchester, who was a book collector. And then many of the books wound up in the library of the Royal College of Physicians. Yet the twilight years were not all bleak. Queen Elizabeth, recognizing his talents, albeit in a limited capacity, appointed him as the warden of Christ College in Manchester. But even here, Dee found challenges. He struggled with insubordinate fellows and a fading respect for his once celebrated stature. However, time has had a way of rekindling appreciation. John Dee's legacy, much beyond his life, has proven to be resilient. His profound impact on navigation, cartography, mathematics, and even the seeds of the idea of a British empire have firmly etched his place in the annals of history. 
His tireless ventures into the occult, his angelic communions, and his alchemical experiments have also made him a legendary figure in more esoteric circles, fascinating and inspiring generations of spiritual seekers and scholars alike. He's a man of insatiable curiosity, straddling the world of empirical studies and the mystic unknown. His life and work serve as a reminder of the thin line between genius and heresy, science and magic, and the enduring quest for knowledge, both seen and unseen. Perhaps in the realm of culture, one of the most enduring speculations is his potential inspiration for William Shakespeare's enigmatic character Prospero in The Tempest. Prospero, much like Dee, is a scholar and magician, wielding both knowledge and supernatural power on an isolated island. Whether Shakespeare drew directly from Dee's life or not, the parallels are striking and showcase the magnitude of Dee's imprint on the collective consciousness of his time. John Dee remains an enigma, a man ahead of his time yet deeply rooted in the traditions of his era. His legacy, a blend of science and sorcery, continues to inspire, mystify, and remind us of the unquenchable human thirst to understand the vastness of our universe, both seen and unseen. And we will stop it there, my friends. Thank you so much for listening. Just a reminder that if you want more tutor in your life, I do have a growing YouTube channel where I put out shorter content several times a week. Um, I will put a link to subscribe in the description. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, why not make sure you're subscribed so you never miss any of the tutor stuff I put out. Thank you so much, my friends, for listening. And I will talk with you again soon. Bye bye. Holy Sam Lee is on sea.